from Las Vegas. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube covering Interconnect 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Now your host, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live here in Las Vegas for IBM Interconnect 2016. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante, our next guest, Bob Egan, who's the founder and CEO of Sephiram Group, analyst, been in the business for a long time, has seen waves of innovation, inflection point after inflection point, but also lived through a lot of the big ones, and including now, welcome to theCUBE. Welcome, John, thank you. Bob, well, great, it's great to have you on. Uh, one, as an analyst, you're covering a hot area with mobile, okay, and impact the customers and CIOs, who actually, it's on everyone's agenda. Yeah, it's pretty sure much is. obviously, yeah. Yeah. boardroom conversation, whatever you, want to, whatever you want to say, that's happening. Yep. Now, making it happen is a little bit different story. You need a little cloud in there, you got analytics, you got data, you need to have some differentiation, and all under the digital transformation. And then throw some IoT to com complex things yeah, on top of right. it. That's right. Yeah. Give us your analysis. I mean, what are you seeing in the landscape right now? Um, obviously, the trends are hot. What's your thoughts on the mobile meets CIO agenda? I think there are two things. Uh, first, IBM today has talked a lot about the big gap, right? So it's gap, cloud, and the migration between on-prem and hybrid. They've talked about a little bit about IoT and mobility, and it's not just about hardware mobility or metal mobility, right? It, it's really about services. But when the rubber meets the road, the real issue around CIOs, especially around mobility and IoT, is that when they're wrestling with all these issues and they're trying to drive business velocities, they've taken a look at mobile and they're saying, geez, this kind of feels like I'm standing alongside a, a cold, fast-moving Alaskan river with a lot of rocks, right? <laughs> and so we've got all these different device standards, and we've got this competition, we've got immaturity and a lot of DevOps standards. So the stand back saying, is this river ever going to get a little bit warmer? Is somebody going to clear the rocks? Is it ever going to be a lot more safe for me to make bigger bets for mobility and with mobility for my employees, right? Because we've seen the consumer wave happen, right? There's a million and a half apps in the Google Play Store. 100 million downloads, Apple quoted. Big deal. You know, you're seeing some like adrenaline junkies sort of you know, jump in. I mean. CIO or Spotify, I mean, I don't know much about Spotify, but other than I'm a client. Yeah, we also have to separate sort of the new wave companies, you know, versus traditional companies that are trying to reinvent themselves, right? So I, IBM talks about thinking big, right? But, you know, when you think too big, you know, there's big risks, right? And so we see the emergence of CIOs and chief digital officers trying to get their act together, because face it, 85% of their budget is just keeping the lights on. What we're talking about is 15% of the budget and anything else they can beg, borrow, and steal to drive innovation with areas like IoT, with cloud migration, and with mobility. I mean, this river, icy river with rocks, you can also say the North Atlantic with icebergs, with the Titanic reference, yeah. but it really is a dangerous spot. So I want to drill down on that with you. Is it a fact because of standards, lack of standards, or just full acceleration from commercial vendors, open source, all of the above. What are the factors that make this a dangerous game? Not only the chilly waters, but also you know, the rapids and the rocks. You got a lot, a lot of threats there. Yeah. So what is the, how will you stack rank the challenges for this IoT market and mobile? Is it the standards or lack of? Well, I think it's a lot of little things. Some of the things you mentioned, like standards, competing operating systems. You also have to realize that when you think about the average company, right? It's still a Windows environment. And now we've got this heterogeneous edge showing up. Whether that edge are Android devices, whether they're Windows-based devices, whether they're Apple-based devices, and now we have all the sensorization of everything, whether it's wearables or the seven to 11 sensors that are sitting in the phones, and what do you do all that? So the first thing is thinking beyond the desktop, right? Second is thinking beyond the app, right? and thinking a lot more about what is the utility that someone needs in order to drive two fundamental metrics in the company, right? The first is, how do you raise the return on the assets that you own? And the second is, how do you drive bigger revenues for each employee as a contribution to the company, right? If you can't get beyond those two metrics as a CIO, you, you know, you're just on the expense side of the balance sheet. So it's productivity of the assets and it's productivity of the, the people, really. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, Here's right? some benchmarks on just order of magnitude, just anecdotally, compare and contrast what people might be familiar with 
uh, companies and their ratios of of um, asset leverage and or um, revenue per employee? Well, you know, one of the one of the big areas has to do with the automobile industry. We've seen a lot of stats even today by IBM thrown around. And the fact is that a company like General Motors produces about a dollar eighty-five for every asset that it's owned. You compare that to someone like a, a new idea company like Tesla. They, they produce over $3,000, uh, sorry, $11 per asset. If you look at... Sorry, which company was that? Uh, Tesla. 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 Oh, Tesla. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Tesla. And, and if you look at the United Postal Service, right, uh, they generate like a dollar per revenue per employee. If you take somebody like Box as a storage company, right, they generate over $3,000 of value per asset, right? And so somewhere in the middle... How about Uber? They have no assets. Right. Or so, do they? So, so well, they, they, <laughs> they have well, they, plans. So they here's the thing. New idea companies are not burdened with heavy assets and heavy metal, however you want to define that. Where they are really loading up is on analytics and customer experience and reducing the friction of, of how both their employees and also how their customers interface with the services that they have for sale. So what's an asset in that, in that right. equation? You could, you could make <laughs> yeah. that argument that right. if General Motors and Ford today will say, you know what, we're not in the car business anymore. We're in the transportation business. I think you and I were actually talking about that last yeah, night, we right? Were. I mean, they're, they're beginning to take a look at what the future of that is, right? And you know what, banks need to be rethinking what business they're in. They're not about moving cash around to ATMs and in out of people's pockets. Well, yep. certainly that's going to get the cloud attention. You're talking about OpEx versus CapEx, and you know, Tesla certainly hides a ball on CapEx. You yeah, look at their got, numbers. Yep. I mean, they're, from our analysis, is a very unprofitable company on a per car. I think they're losing $50,000 per car yeah. uh, from what is being kind of uh, reported from our, some of our team members. But are they sub what are they subsidizing? I mean, this, is, this comes back to another question. Where's the value shift? Well, that's really see, kind that, of seems that's to be the most the interesting point, right? So we're, we're seeing a lot of these VC-driven or early-stage companies that have really big valuations, and they have big ideas, right? And to some extent, um, winner, takes all kind winner of, takes all kind of thing, right? Yeah. And then we have the old world companies that we know need to make changes, right? Somewhere in the middle, we're going to redefine the economics of what, how, how business velocity drives profitability, how customers' experience defines, right, what the new world looks like. I mean, the big question, I think, on a lot of people's minds is that we have built a PC desktop market, which is going to top out in a couple of years at maybe 2.2 or 2.3 billion units, right? The mobile phone industry is already a 4 billion unit market. The smartphone industry is a 2 billion, right? You could argue that based on the, the number of desktops around, that the smartphone market has already supplanted the desktop market as the center of innovation, right? And now we're talking about IoT and all the sensors making that, a, you know, 10 or 20 times bigger than that. Yeah, I mean, I would make that argument for sure, but so I love what your two metrics, your return on assets and your revenue per employee. So if I'm a GM or a company with a lot of physical assets, yeah. I want to digitize those assets and yeah. I want to figure out how do I drive revenue. So, so what are you seeing out there? Um, you know, um, are, and, and what's the role of the CIO in terms of doing that? Is it the line of business person that's really driving that? Is the CIO sort of standing back at that, you know, that, that stream with the rocks in Alaska? Or are they, yeah, yeah. You, know, you, you, know, you know, you see people jumping in yet? Or? There's some companies that jump in. A lot of companies are still wrestling, trying to define what the future of a CIO is, right? And, and in some cases, they're, they're elevating other people into, into mm -hmm. this role called chief digital operator. What, however the name of the title turns out to be, it really is about digital transformation. To your point, you got to digitize these assets. You got, you, in order to drive vis, business velocity, you got to do something different. And I think what a lot of companies have come to do is take a close look that whatever your differences are as a CIO or as chief digital officer or, or a line of business person that says, look, I don't really care about all this stuff. All I want to do is get my salespeople selling more stuff at a lower cost, right? they're all beginning to rally around this point around business velocity. At the end of the day, for every invested dollar, whether it's in mobile or IoT or cloud or anything else, yep. where you have to ask yourself the question, if I have four billion new potential relationships because of the smartphone market out there, how can I capitalize my fair share and how can I avoid being disrupted by my competitor? Because if you look across the gap, of mobile and IoT and cloud and analytics, 
you're either going to choose to be disrupted or you're going to get disrupted. And everybody's going to take a look at your gaps. And they're going to figure out what your weakness is if you're not digitizing and building the analytics and gaining the intelligence behind that. So analytics and UX, obviously the new asset class as you're kind of speculating, we'll, we'll just put that and kind of yeah, lay that out there. package, yeah. I put that out there and, and digitizing everything. I coined that term this morning in the keynote. I mean, IBM should just say it, that's their strategy, digitize yeah. everything, because yeah. yeah. that's what they want their customers to do right. in this digital asset transformation build out from transmission video to everything else. That being said, I get that. I want to just get a comment from you on the <laughs> Apple guy. Yeah, who yeah. I love, by the way, I love to see <laughs> Apple on stage yeah. saying, hey, we're badass, Apple. We're kicking ass, we're taking names, we have billions <laughs> in cash all over the place, 100 billion downloads. They own, they change the game. Okay, everyone knows that. The iPhone was a seminal moment in, in history. But he said something interesting about Swift, okay, and he's talking about it on stage. Yeah. Take advantage of the machines, of the hardware. Right. Okay. Sounds a little like Oracle to me. Look we'll back to the second. We'll yeah. Put that on pause. I remember those days. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Take advantage of the, of, <laughs> of the hardware. Na he's plugging native apps. Of course, he wants native apps because they sell iPhones and, and right. gear. Take advantage of the hardware. Is that the right approach to have write the native app? And how do companies deal with the data ingestion and the programmability of the real time nature? What's your take on that? Native web response. What do they do? Well, I think it's the right design paradigm at the right time. I, you know, Dave, you asked a little bit about what, what's sort of the holdup for a lot of CIOs. And some of that has to do with this war of the worlds around code portability, right? And so in a perfect world, we built the web because it was ultimately portable. And now we have cell phone manufacturers which are, are making the, the access to native hardware calls unavailable. And so unless you use their programming tools, right? like in the case of Apple with Swift, right, to get at the core attributes to make the application user experience better or more efficient or faster, right? And so for a lot of CIOs, they don't care about that, right? They care about what can my customers, what can my partners, and what do my end users do? So in some cases, if people are looking to get up fast and experiment, they're going to they're gonna walk away from maybe some of the cutesy little hardware-dependent factors, and they're going to go right to web because it's faster. We don't have the issues at the network level anymore because the networks are fast. They have very low latency, which was re really the killer in sort of the phase one, right? Networks were, were, were semi-fast, but there was a lot of delays. You asked for something and you waited. Today, if you wait more than you know, three or four milliseconds, you lost your customer. So Bob, what do you make of the IBM Apple relationship? When it first came out, some people said, oh, it's just an attempt by IBM trying to make itself relevant. Uh, it's a better deal for Apple than it is for IBM. And then all of a sudden, typical IBM, they pour all this money in. They're the number one you know, Swift developer, 100 apps. Um, but are you seeing it pay off in terms of business impact, business value that they're creating for people? Well, I think, I think it's certainly a great marketing relationship for both companies, right? I think you know, uh, Tim Cook and others may disagree with, with my view of Apple's market share in the enterprise, right? But a lot of companies uh, certainly jumped on the Ample bandwagon. A lot of CIOs want to get out from underneath that bandwagon because they view it as too closed and too heavy-handed an ecosystem, right? On the other hand, they worry about the security side of Android. And of course, that's what John Chen and BlackBerry are trying to do is, is do an end run up the middle. Right. Um, I think for, for IBM, they've seen a lot of traction on the consulting side of the business because of that relationship with Apple. But I'm not so sure it's moving product, mm -hmm. right? And so I think you saw a couple of announcements today around you know, the product side, about you know, what they're doing, more tightly integrating with Swift. We're seeing you know, more, more work around Bluemix and making things faster and easier. And so I think that they're, they're trying to do an end run uh, into the developer community, say, we have a better way. And I guess we'll see. Mobile World Congress is going on right yeah. now. Uh, what's your pulse in there? Obviously you got your uh, ears to the ground. Yeah. You're here obviously physically in Vegas. But you know, we saw Zuckerberg over there with virtual reality. 5G's been a big topic. Yeah. Uh, unified communications is changing radically. That's now business communications. That whole notion of voice and, and, and messaging has gone to a whole nother level. Yeah. yeah. And traditional enterprise unified communications. Yeah. Yeah. Boring. <laughs> slow, irrelevant. <laughs> Where's the relevance now? It shifts. Well, you know, in some, your it, thoughts. In some <laughs> cases, uh, Mobile World Congress is sort of a tale of two cities, right? On the one hand, it's new phones. Like Samsung has got a whole slew of new announcements with their phones. Everybody will have announcements on phones. 
and it's sort of a diminishing return on what those net new improvements are from a consumer viewpoint, right? I mean, who walks around complaining that their camera's no good today, right? <laughs> who doesn't like how good their screen really looks? They complain if they break, but they complain if they wet. So we'll see some innovation around some of that stuff. And, but John, to your point, I remember 1995 when the talk about universal communication was the big deal. And so the other side of the city is we're returning back to that future and we're talking a lot more about yeah. unified communication because we have a lot of these disparate well, Integrated different apps though, now you have virtual reality, you got AI, now you have Watson, cognitive engines, yeah. you now have um, 5G, yeah. so you got all that happening, and then it's all data driven now. Yeah. So now you got IoT. So yeah. I think when you look behind the scenes at, uh, at Mobile World Congress, the biggest thing you're going to see is more and more talk about 5G for a couple of reasons. One is it's not a major forklift for an operator, right? It's all about getting more efficiency into the network. And because, you know, we'll see a 10x growth at minimum in the kind of capacity flowing over mobile networks that's going to be video and audio, you know, voice over IP audio, that the operators really need that. They need to catch up with Moore's Law that mobile operators and the cost paradigm for them has really been lagging Moore's Law. They get killed by over the top. I mean, WhatsApp is a great example. Yeah. I mean, Skype had great leadership, and look what's happened with that business. Yeah. I mean, where yeah, are we? We're the Skype for business now, right? Or well, actually, Link for business is now Skype for business, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. they dig Skype for business, they're doing their own video. But is it siloed anymore? This brings up the question here at the IBM Interconnect Conference, is siloed applications um, really aren't going to do well unless they plug into some sort of horizontally scalable fabric of some sort. Right. It's kind of a, you know, catch-22 if yeah, you Yeah, I mean, I, I think you'd argue that, you know, Apple did a wonderful job with the user experience and touch and the simplicity of apps, right? And now we've had a million and a half and over a hundred billion downloads of applications and people are beginning to say, do I really want to touch an app and open up an app and do something with that app? Or is it some sort of experience where I, I want to have an experience and embedded in that experience, I don't want to have to think, oh, am I going to do video or am I going to do audio or am I going to read a barcode or am I going to make a payment, right? They want a more holistic, seamless, not seamless, non intrusive experience. They don't want a lot of context switching. They don't, they don't. And today we're, we're app, you know, point driven. In fact, I, I, I'll make the prediction that as IoT gets really big, the app economy as we know it today disappears. That's a bold Th prediction. Think Say that again slower so we can as capture the, it. As, the, as, as IoT gets really big, the app economy as we know it today begins to collapse. Because it gets subsumed into well, it Not only gets subsumed, but you know, think about what you're interacting with, right? You're interacting with a wearable, right? You're interacting with that thing. That thing is doing all kinds of things in the back, but, but but you're doing something with all the sensors or the sensors are autonomously doing something for you. You're no longer interacting with an app anymore. Is, is the human no longer the last mile in that scenario? Well, the wearable <laughs> becomes the last mile, right? right? Yes. I mean, I made a prediction, somebody was talking about it uh, last week, that in 1999 I said, you know, within five or six years, people will own three devices and carry two, right? And I, I was really poo pooed by that. Oh, you were right well, on. I'll think, yeah. think about going into the future. We, we went from a, you know, people in their cars had no microprocessors, now they have 11. We have cell phones that have multiple microprocessors and, and between seven and 11 sensors. And now it's wearables, right? Five or 10 years from now, we'll own one device and we'll be wearing or interfacing with things that we don't carry anymore physically. Right, they're in their cars, they're in our refrigerators, they're, they're everywhere but us carrying a tablet, a phone, and a laptop with us. Bob, thanks so much for coming on. I've got some great guests, Neil Henderson, Apex coaching founder, cycling guru, is going to come on and give us some mentoring. Right. Um, but I want to get the final word for you here. Thanks for sharing your, your insight, and the prediction was phenomenal. I love that collapse. I would even say slow motion collapse uh, of the <laughs> app economy. Um, not too, no, we'll put any favors from Apple on that one. Give us your take on the IBM show here. What's the vibe? in this time in history of IBM's inflection point, as they, I won't say turn around, that's more of an HP term, but as they go to the digital transformation, yeah, yeah. they are essentially retooling. And you can see how they've organized over the past five years. What is the vibe of this show here in Las Vegas? You know, my, my personal view of the show is that there's a lot of excitement. IBM uh, has made some very interesting acquisitions, and I think people are really listening closely to see how well they're going to integrate those acquisitions and capitalize them because there's a lot of partners here, there's a lot of customers here, and they're, they're saying, how are you going to do that in order for me to get more business velocity, 
right? And generate more revenue and the return on assets that we talked about a little while longer. So a lot of excitement, we'll see what happens. Bob Egan, founder of Ziffrin Group, um, here on theCUBE, sharing his research, research firm. Great, check him out, uh, at Bob Egan on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be right back with more here on theCUBE after this short break. Great, thanks. Yeah.